Hey there everyone, welcome on into VG Emporium, video game music and more. Um, today, uh, I, I got me another guest. I have non-stop guests coming into the shop. It's a, this is a cool and great thing. So I'm gonna let him introduce himself and uh, tell you about what we're uh, talking about today. I am Professor Tom. I'm the host of Shujin Academy VGM Club, a rival VGM podcast. Uh, I also play a lot of game music on my show and I've come into the shop and tried to get a side job because being a teacher doesn't pay very well. So hopefully, you know, AJ will pay me a little. You will pay me, right? Um, I'll see what I can do. Um, you know, being an emporium, it's kind of hit and miss with things I can, you know, I, I sell things. The prices aren't that high, but I'll give you what I can. Well, maybe I'll at least get some commission. So today I brought in a bunch of investigation themed songs from detective type games. They're not all straight up detective games, but they're all games that involve investigating in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, no, um, I kind of had to rack my brain on uh, things to bring in for this because, uh, you know, yeah, you said, first thing you said detectives, but then you said specifically investigation. So that kind of kind of mixed it up a bit. But I think I got some, uh, some tracks to kind of counterbalance what you got here. I thought it should be broader than just detectives because it let us play things like Professor Layton and uh, one of the songs we'll play later. There is a straight up detective yeah. song that I brought. <laughs> yeah, I think I got one as well, or at least that's related to a detective. Detective. Gotta enunciate my words better. I verb enunciate very well. Is good, yes. Speak verb. Speak verb. Al, you speak verb? All right. <laughs> <laughs> so I gotta ask, so like, um, why, uh, so why are we starting out with, uh, or why did you bring in Layton, I should ask? Well, uh, Professor Layton is a game about solving mysteries and solving puzzles. And there's a lot of really good music in it. And when I played through the game, I really enjoyed it. Uh, this is Layton's theme from Professor Layton and the Curious Village, which is the first game in the series. And, you know, in it, you walk through a curious village mm. uh, where everyone is obsessed with puzzles and you have to solve all the puzzles to play through the game. It's a lot of fun. I like those latent games. Yeah, I did play through the first one uh, via a DS emulator because I never owned a DS myself, but um, I did enjoy it and I think I almost got to the end, but then I got stuck on like kind of one of the more harder side puzzles because I was kind of in that mentality of I got to do all the puzzles, which I probably did not need to do. Yeah, when I uh, did play through it, I did like the music that was in it and actually kind of tried to find it and, you know, listen to it outside of the game because it's, you know, pretty uh, pretty nice, like, especially for a handheld at the time. Yeah, they got a lot of mileage out of that DS processor. Like, the DS is yeah. funny because sometimes the composers would be very chip y with it, and then sometimes the composers yeah. would sound like this, like they'd sat down with a bunch of violins and really recorded it. Yeah, it's because um, I think, like, I would consider the DS as, like, one of the last, like, actual consoles that you could be called chip tune because it has, like, you know, its own, like, uh, sound processor, which does, like, process samples like how, you know, the SNES would, mm -hmm. but, like, with a lot more channels, and it's kind of probably more closer to how the PlayStation was with like how it did things, but um, but then there's all stuff like this, which is um, actually sounds like it's pre-recorded and then streamed through the processor. I can believe that. I think the DS is the last of the chip -y consoles. The 3DS is not the same. I've never even messed with anything on the 3DS emulator-wise or anything like that. That is a huge hole in my, uh, in my knowledge. So I do not know nothing. There are so many games. Everybody's got gaming knowledge holes. Like, there's so many games. Like, I've never even seen a 3DO or a CDI in person. I've never tried to play any game from either of those consoles. I've barely played anything for the Master System. I do own a Master System, but I've barely ever played anything on it. I only have two games. I had a Master System. I had a lot of games. And somehow the one that I got, like, my parents got it for me at a garage sale. And it had the FM sound chip when the US release should not have had it. So somehow either it was like a misrelease or somebody imported it and then said, I don't want this no more and just sold it at a garage sale. And I love that thing. Yeah, I wonder what that story and is. And I don't know what happened to it. I can't, like, um, I did a lot of moving. So I'm imagining I, it somehow got lost in one of the big moves that we made from, you know. So yeah, it's one of my, uh, one of my biggest regrets losing that thing. I believe that it's like, I regret selling my Super Nintendo. I wound up having to buy another Super Nintendo and another Genesis. 
both. I regret selling those systems. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hindsight is not a fun thing. But sometimes hindsight can be very helpful in investigations now, can it not? Absolutely. You think about what happened yesterday, and you're like, oh, the butler dropped this rock at 2 p.m. <laughs> that means that he was the murderer's accomplice. He done did it. He duty done it. And uh, <laughs> oh, I wish I could uh, figure out how to link that into my next track, but maybe I can. Well, actually, I can because, you know, you think about it. Our next track is kind of dealing with that in hindsight, you know, sometimes. You think about one little detail that happened to you the day before, and it turns out to be a lead that helps you forward in your investigation. So what the next track I'm going to be playing for you here is the first lead from SD Snatcher, and this is composed by the uh, Konami Kokeha Club. with that lead uh, hopefully we can uh, solve this it'll help us solve this mystery that was the first lead from SD Snatcher composed by Konami Kukeha Club and I'm going with Konami Kukeha Club because there are way too many composers on this and the uh, VGM pack that I ripped this from uh, did not specify which one of those folks composed this particular track so what system is it. this for because that song is cool uh, um, this is on the MSX so okay. I think the uh, version that this is from the MSX 2 Turbo I can buy that yeah yeah, and it's using, uh, you know, the Konami's um, own, like, custom sound chip. Or not custom sound chip? Or it's, like, you know, one that they use in their games, and it's called, like, the SEC. I can't remember the name of the actual chip, but, um, you know, it's, like, a wavetable synthesis chip and um, has, like, I think it's, like, five or six channels of wavetable. And then they also use the AY chip that's, like, you know, based inside the MSX for percussion stuff. Yeah, it's, like, how they have their own sound mappers for the NES, and they only use them on a handful of games. And that that song is really cool. Snatcher is one of those things we didn't we we barely got it over here. We might as well have not really gotten it over here because it barely got a release on the Sega CD, and like nobody bought it. I wish they'd re-released it for the PlayStation here, or they would you know like Konami. I wish Konami would just remaster it for the modern consoles, like they have with so many other games like the Contra Collection and the Castlevania Collection and yeah this one and then Police Knots mm -hmm. Police would be Knots like, is you another know, one kind of like a nice little because like they're both kind of you know they're both by Kojima and they're kind of like the same style of game mm -hmm. you know set in the future it's a visual adventure yeah no this would be like a cool little duology to like for them to actually remaster and re-release it would there you go Konami you can print money you listen to Rage Cage yeah. and Professor Tom we know what we're talking about I'd, I mean, they have the fan. They have the fan base for it now because you know there are people exactly. like you know that are really like this game. And then, um, yeah, actually, I remember um, I had emulated on like you know the the Sega CD version, mm -hmm. but um, it was my first adventure into like the MSX like hole to like figure out how to emulate the original Snatcher, and um, I couldn't quite get it to work on the uh, emulator I found, which is Blue MSX, but I did find one for um, Illusion City, which is kind of a similar setting, like a dystopian future, but it's an RPG instead, and that was a, you know, that was a huge discovery for myself, so, 
Yeah, cool little cool little thing there, but Yeah, the MSX is a, a rabbit hole that I would love to go down. I just can't quite make time for it because I'm too busy being addicted to Persona and Slay the Spire and <laughs> other stuff. Yeah, no, um yeah, the MSX is really interesting because there are so many because it was like made as like a um a standard. Mm-hmm. So, like, anybody could really make their own version, and then each version had, like, you know, maybe s- some slight differences. They all came with, like, the base AY chip, but then they would have, like, you know, have, like, multiple sound chips on top of that. Mm-hmm. So you could have, like, the YM2413 FM, have the, uh, you know, this, the SCC sound chip, which is the Konami. Mm-hmm. Um, people have been able to actually get, like, the YM26 um, or 2203 to work on that. and You could do, just... like, five entire episodes about chiptune stuff. And I know because you have. <laughs> I have, and yeah, no, it's it's a it's a it is a pretty fun adventure to go on, but it does take time to kind of set it up, and I haven't really had the time to do it lately. It's like you may have noticed, a lot of my episodes are kind of slapdashy. Oh, that's fine. Well, you know, it, you're getting paid big bucks at the Emporium. Everybody in VGM podcasting is making so much money. Like, oh my god. God, I am rolling in it. I have piles of it that I jump in and just kind of just sit there wrapped around it. Yeah, I had a co. It's it's like <laughs> uh, it's like Scrooge McDuck in Ducktales. You just dive into the vault full of money. I had a coworker a few months ago ask me. She like stopped for a second. She was like, "Professor Tom, is VGM podcasting like your side hustle where you're making a bunch of money?" And I laughed at her for forty five <laughs> seconds. <laughs> <laughs> side hustle yeah. money yeah podcast what, what, what is that like you know we're not pulling joe rogan numbers here people yeah no that's that's the funny thing is like when friends ask me about it and they kind of like you know do you have do you like have a videos up are you like monetizing it are you getting like advert so like you know it's, uh, i kind of hate what like these big mainstream podcasting things like have done to podcasts because i know there are some that i follow that have patreons but it's mostly to like you know kind of just fund like their hosting services being able to do the research being able to do like you know events and stuff yeah that stuff isn't free but then like you know yeah yeah but then when it's like people talking about like podcasts is like you know for making money and actually like you know income it's like ugh. yeah if we were trying That's to make money we would be doing wonky. this podcast about something else like that you know a lot more i'd podcast about something a lot more mainstream like maybe i'd do a wrestling podcast i don't know wrestlemania well unfortunately this is we're on a wrestling podcast. This is a VGM podcast, and we're talking about Investigation VGM. And I'm going to tell you about why I brought this one on here. Is because in the game Snatcher, you play as uh, I can't remember his name, but you are what is it? A Junker. So basically, think Blade Runner, but not that because copyright. But um, yeah, you play as a Junker, and you have to uh, find what are called Snatchers, which are these robotic beings that will um, you know kill and then uh, take on the you know. At persona and skin of the whoever they kill. Um, it's been a while since I played it, but um, yeah. So you have to find all these things, and uh, you start off with a partner who is like you know a grizzle old detective that you know has been doing this for a while, and then you find him killed, and so you have to kind of figure out like who killed him, why he get killed, why he got killed, and it just leads up to all this craziness. And um, you know there isn't questions of whether he's a snatcher because like uh, Blade Runner with Deckard and all, but um, you know it gets pretty it gets uh, pretty interesting. Very, very cyberpunk. Yeah. This is kind of like one of those uh, big cyberpunk setters, like, you know, as far as, like, game, like, you know, games in the future would kind of be based off of this, like, how it's based off of Blade Runner cyberpunk world. Isn't this, don't you have a, a Metal Gear sidekick? Yep, Mach 2. That's so cool. Yeah. Metal Gear Mach 2! <laughs> Yeah, it just rolls around with you, and he's kind of like your little, uh, like, menus option guy and giving you little information bits and stuff, and yeah. Yeah pretty it was a pretty interesting little playthrough um i got stuck um in it because uh, for some reason the emulator and the rom did not like each other in this one particular scene it got stuck there and every time i would start it back up like you know a fresh game or even a load up the save state it would just be that scene stuck like with like this weird steam stuff scrolling on the bottom so yeah i never got to finish it never got to finish yeah, it. yeah i never finished front mission three for similar reasons I'm, it, you know, I, on the one hand, it sucks that you can't finish it because of all these emulator problems. But on the other hand, we get to play stuff like Snatcher that, you know, never had a release over here that didn't get an official English translation, like for a computer standard that didn't even exist here in the States. And that is cool as hell. Yeah. 
Oh yeah. Uh, don't cry because you had an emulator problem. Smile because you got to play the game in the first place. Hey, you know, smile I did when I did get to play it because it was a really beautiful game, like especially that Sega CD version. But um, this next track you brought in here um, features a creature that has a half smile, a very sinister half smile. And it's coming from Danganronpa, and the track is called Closing Argument, composed by Masafumi Takada.
What's, uh, what's, uh, so what kind of investigation are we doing next here, prof Professor? Well, next up, we're going to talk about Danganronpa, Trigger Happy Havoc, a game where there's a bunch of kids who are all stuck in a high school where they're not allowed to leave and, unless they murder each other. And it's a little like, um, it's compared to Battle, Roya Battle Royale or uh, Hunger Games sometimes, because it's a, you know, teenagers killing each other kind of a game where you then have to investigate. And he, if, if somebody gets away with the murder, they're allowed to leave and everybody else dies. So your goal is to not die and investigate all of these murders. And it, it's, it's very melodramatic and very anime. And cool as hell. Yeah, no, um, I, I know, um, I remember hearing uh, Purnell of Rhythm and Pixels talk about this game, and, um, yeah, I think, didn't they make an anime based off of this as well? Oh, yeah. I'm thinking of, yeah, I think, I think I, I remember seeing the ads for that as well, and that was my first time actually hearing about it, because, again, I wasn't, I wasn't part of the gaming scene throughout the entire 2010s, except for on PC with Steam and stuff, so I kind of missed out on a lot of this stuff. Oh, yeah, and this was a Vita game. Like, this was not a big mainstream game. It was like, like there were there were two reasons I bought a Vita. There was this, uh, it was to play Danganronpa, and it was to play Persona Three Port. Sorry, Persona Four Golden. I played Persona Four Golden, and I played Danganronpa, and it was completely worth buying the system just for those two games. The Vita is a great system. It's like it's like the Dreamcast. It was just too good for this world. Now that's what it seems like. Just like between you and then talking to Gene Draband and. You know, hear what I'm hearing other podcasts. That's what it's. That's what it's sounding like and feeling like. Yeah, the Vita's the coolest system nobody bought. <laughs> oh man, and um, I wanted to mention um, this music by Masafumi Takada. Um, yeah, no, I can definitely, you know, hearing it is definitely. Yeah, I'm really liking this because it it sounds like something that would fit right into Killer Seven or another like um, you know, earlier Grasshopper games. Because um, you know it's like got that piano, it's got like the um, electronic pads going on in the background, that nice beat thing, and just like the kind of the chords and the slightly discordant sound of it all is just really. It's a little unsettling because you're, you know, going through this crazy period where like you're trying to be friends with all of these people, and also they're trying to murder each other, and <laughs> it's a cool game. Like I don't know if you've seen the stuff for it, but there's Monokuma who's the bad guy, and he's like this half black, half white stuffed bear yeah it has like one like one side has like this huge grin on it yeah i i literally have a stuffed monokuma that i can i can hug sometimes when i'm sad <laughs> or when i'm feeling murderous hmm. don't don't <laughs> let don't let don't let that side get to you tom yeah Some, stay good because i know tom. those i know those students can get on your nerves sometimes but don't yeah. Don't let that don't let that other side of the kuma get you. Yeah, the students are both the best part and the worst part of teaching. <laughs> I'm not a teacher. I was never a teacher, but my wife was. Um, she like is an English major, and she was a substitute teacher for the longest time as well. And um, yeah, for the most part, she really liked you know likes working with kids. But you know, of course, be doing high school, like uh, she you know there were there were days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my wife my wife is sort of a teacher. She works with college students though not with high school students so that is a different world a lot more cursing a lot more cursing maybe slightly more adjusted maybe i don't know only slightly i can't remember i can't remember it's been so long now well seeing as we uh played a masafumi takata track i have another one here for you from one of his uh earlier soundtracks Ooh. actually and it's a. Uh, this is actually from the first grasshopper manufacturer game which um i still need to play myself so this is uehara kamui or the theme of Uehara Kamui from the Silver Case, or in Japan, Silver Jikan, and this is composed by Masafumi Takada. I have never heard of this.
Wow. Welcome back. Yeah. That is yeah, really no, that cool. Is really good. I'm going to have to check out that whole yeah, soundtrack. So I've never even heard <laughs> of this game. Yes, and that game was The Silver Case. And this was U- the theme of Uehara Kamui, composed by Masafumi Takada. And yeah, no, I have not played this game yet. I've known about this game for the longest time, and I've been meaning to play it. Like when they first re released it on uh, Steam, like years ago, I was going to get it. And then I kind of just forgot, cause like, because I got too busy to play games on my computer. And then I was thinking about getting the um, uh, Silvercase 20 something, rather. I can't remember what it was called, but it's like for the Switch, and it's basically the ultimate collection, but it was just a little too much for I was ready to pay for it. And. I might just be able to get it cheaper on Steam. I'm not sure if it's different or not. But yeah, this is a pretty interesting game. It's, uh, you play as, um, I can't remember the name of the uh, main character, but you're basically investigating these, um, cases, like, series of murders. And, uh, this character, Uehara Kamui, is actually one of the first suspects because he was involved with a murder that was very similar to a lot of these, these killings that are being investigated now. But it turns out it's not him, but he becomes, like, kind of a central character. You never play as him, but he's, like, the central character that, like, a lot of the story beats kind of come back to and focus on. I'm going to have to check this out. At bare minimum, I'm going to have to download this soundtrack because that is cool as hell. Yeah, um, you know, the way I listen to it is like through the PSF, so um, if, if you're familiar with, um, do you listen to like, you know, raw format files like the you know, VGM, PSF, NSF? Not usually. It's one of those things that I need to, that's another one of those rabbit holes that I need to go down because it sounds really cool. Yeah, because this is how I listen to this, this soundtrack, is through the PSF that I got through um, Josh W's website. And um, yeah, all the music in this game is really cool. And this is actually a, a variation on one of the earlier themes that like is plays first in this soundtrack. And um, yeah, now this um, this game is visually just really cool. Like all the art's really nice. And um, it does this, um, like it has multiple screens kind of going on. It's like a weird like visual novel type mm-hmm. situation but it's yeah i don't I mean, know a lot of what we're talking about today are visual novels yeah or pseudo visual novels the line between visual novel and video game is really blurry sometimes especially nowadays because like you know anything can be a visual novel but it can have more to it because like you know back in the day visual novels were basically a game that was like you know just interacted by in the thing you could just make the text go forward and then maybe give you some options whereas now like mm-hmm. in the case of this game there's actually puzzles that come up that you can solve while like kind of going through like all these um, uh, scenarios and then things like, you know, Phoenix Wright, which is basically, you know, you're doing investigations mm-hmm. and uh, you know, you're going through scene to scene, but then like, of course, like the court scenes are like visual novels, but you're interacting it with like all your evidence and stuff and kind of changing the outcomes. Yeah. Like the, uh, the blaze blue and uh, the persona arena fighting games are both, they both have these big long visual novel chunks in story mode and you're just reading all of this text and then suddenly you're playing a fighting game for three rounds <laughs> and then you're back to reading all the text yeah i think it was that i mentioned talked with this about uh with uh Rican, who was on my last guest mm-hmm. and um yeah i was playing through the second blast blue game and i was doing the story mode and i was just surprised by how much text there was between the fights it was crazy and just like but it was pretty cool because yeah. you actually get to play as like some different characters throughout the story too so you know that like kind of changed yeah. it up the part of the reason why I chose this track was because this character, Kamui, um, Kamui Uehara, or Uehara Kamui, however you want to say it, um, shows up in the No More Heroes games. First, in Travis Strikes Again, as like in the again the uh, visual novel bits that are the story bits in between the main game. And then he shows up again in No More Heroes 3 as like a just one-off thing. And this a remix of this theme plays in that moment, and it's uh, it's really cool. That is a cool concept. I'm glad they came back and revisited that. Yeah, No More Heroes, like Travis Strikes Again, was basically the 20th anniversary of Grasshopper Manufacturers and a big love letter to um, just Japanese retro gaming, basically. And a huge love letter to all the games that Grasshopper Manufacturer had made. So a lot of their characters showed up, like, you know, um, Dan Smith from Killer7, uh, Mondo Zappa from Killer is Dead, um, just all these things. Like, yeah, it was pretty. It was crazy. You know, and I love these. I'm loving these games. I haven't played a lot of the Grasshopper games, but I'm so glad they're a thing because, like, gaming needs weird. Yeah. Gaming needs like strange art games. Gaming needs unusual stuff. I don't want all of video gaming to be just Call of Duty and Madden. 24 7 no it's cool if you like call of duty it's cool if you like madden but i want there to be so much more than that 
I want there to be just crazy stuff. It's like film. Like, you know, I'm glad that there's Michael Bay movies, but I don't just <laughs> want there to be Michael Bay movies. I want there to be crazy art films. I want there, you know, I want everything <laughs> yeah. everywhere all at once to be a thing. No, that is the truth. So, I think we're getting on in our investigation here. We found one of our suspects. May not be him, though, but um, we got to keep sleuthing. What do we got next to help us out with this? All right, we're going to talk about a real detective now. Oh, dang. We're going to play Dick Gumshoe. It's Detective Gumshoe from Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney for the DS. folks we just met a real detective that was dick gumshoe that's detective gumshoe pal from phoenix wright ace attorney composed by oh i don't got no composers it is masakazu sugimori and naoto tanaka i'm pretty sure it's sugimori who did the original version and tanaka who worked on the ds version and um, we never got the Game Boy version over here. We only got the DS version. And so that's what most people who know the game know in America. But it's... You know, I'm so glad we got this. This is this is one of those games where I can't believe we got it, but I'm so glad we did. This is another one that I played through via DS emulator because I never had a DS. I'm a sad boy, maybe. Um, and this is when I actually did play all the way through and actually got to play the extra story that was um, part of it that was kind of an introduction to the system that they would introduce in, like, the actual first DS proper Phoenix Wright game, which was, I think, what was a uh, Apollo... like Apollo Justice? Yeah, Apollo Justice. I played through Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney on the DS, really liked it, got stuck on it eventually, but I found it was, it was so clever and it was so cool to go through all the courtroom drama it was like living your own episode of matlock <laughs> say matlock yeah yeah matlock. <laughs> that's a name i haven't heard in the longest time i've never seen it i've i've only ever heard it like you know because like you know i'd hear reference to it from adults when i was a kid mm -hmm. so i never actually had to seen it proper my parents are retired and i make fun of them and tell them they have to go to bed at 8 30 after they get done watching matlock <laughs> I, I just assume that's all they do all day long watch matlock imagine that's probably maybe what uh you know dick gumshoe does because i imagine by this point he's probably retired or getting close to it i hope so he looks like he's old in those games and he's grumpy he's grumpy he's ridiculous and actually he would have fit right in with those overtop characters that uh Rican and i were talking about the last couple weeks ago and uh yeah, no, he, I, I did like, I really liked his character because like even, you know, he was kind of stuck with Edgeworth, but um, yeah, like, you know, he was definitely friendly towards Phoenix and just like the scenes with him, he's just a big goofball and, you know, the great guy. 
and he's a good detective as well. It's funny in those games how like the prosecutors are kind of the bad guys, but they do actually want the right things, even if they're cheating just a little. I would like to sit down and watch the Phoenix Wright movie because there's a live action movie. It's just one of those things where I'm really glad it exists. And I'm also glad that Phoenix Wright made it into Marvel vs. Capcom 3 because he's, you know, the the most fightingest <laughs> character in that game. When you think oh, of yeah, fighting, you no. think of Phoenix Wright. I just love that. From what I've seen, it's just a lot of text bubbles, documents. Yeah. He throws out documents. He says he literally says objection as one of his attacks. <laughs> um, he has a super move that summons the judge to literally drop the gavel. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's ridiculous. Well, what I can tell you is that um, we're this is definitely not a fighting game. The next track we got here coming up, it's actually um, another uh, pseudo visual novel. As if we don't have enough of these already. Yeah, this is all about VNs today. That's that's the that's the uh, that's the ulterior motive here. It's investigation, but the ulterior, ulterior motive thing behind this is visual novels. Yeah, but it's not quite the kind of visual novels that Hammock gets into on KVGM. It's the pure family friendly nah. kind. Uh, except for this, well, this one in particular it, uh, does have some naughty bits in it. It's kind of part of all that that whole thing. Um, this is coming from Eve First Error. This is Office, when you're playing as the character Kojiro, and this is composed by Ryo Umimoto, and this is the PC-98 version. Okay, so that was Office Kojiro from Eve Burst Error, composed by Ryo Omimoto, and this was the PC-98 version using the YM2203 sound chip. So what'd you think of that, Tom? What'd you think of that, Professor? That bass slaps. <laughs> that bass slaps. I could teach a class on how slappy that bass is, because that is the platonic example of a slappy bass, and it's so cool. Oh yeah, this entire, this entire OST is just amazing like uh it kind of goes you know this and then ground seed um and uh you know like those that's kind of like the trifecta of like you know Ryo Umemoto, Umemoto and Ryo Takami just like like the best of the of the best though there are some recent um like soundtracks that have been kind of like uh coming out on VGM rips that are rivaling these with both Umemoto and Takami and um 
Yeah, but this is like kind of one of the quintessential ones if you're like starting to get into your like VGM deep diving. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that PC-98 has so much good stuff on it that for, you know, the people in the United States, there's a whole new world there. Oh, yeah. Because that was never a thing we got to. We y The only way you'd see that was in back issues of EGM. And you'd look at it and be like, what the hell is the PC-98? I don't speak any Japanese. I can't play any of these games because they're visual novels in Japanese. This <laughs> did come out on the Saturn albeit very much like censored so a lot of the adult content mm -hmm. removed yeah that saturn is another like it's like the it's like the precursor to the dreamcast oh. like, there's a bunch of good stuff on the saturn that nobody played because there were only three saturns sold in the united states yeah and of course like the whole that whole launch was just yeah, cursed the launch because, like, was a the, disaster yeah, the ps1 and everything but um if anybody's gotten to play this game congratulations to you um i still haven't played it i I don't know if I'll ever actually check it out because I'm just satisfied with listening to the music. Though what I do know is that um, this plays like you get to play as two different characters, and this one uh, is the theme that plays in the office of Kojiro, who is a um, down on his luck private eye, and he's hired by someone to um, investigate uh, something. I, I can't quite remember if it's a murder or if, um, just something. And he and the other characters' uh, storylines kind of intertwine. Like the other characters, like a uh, a special agent who is on on a case as well and uh yeah just certain like events kind of intertwine and like all these characters kind of like you know you meet characters that you met with the other like main character throughout like you know their person's story and then at the uh, as you're getting towards the end everything kind of starts tightening into a like really tight web tightening tight web and like all these beats and characters that you met are starting to really get drawn in close and kind of coming to a head it's a good detective story so yeah this uh, this is another game that's all about investigation and uh sexy times i mean those really do kind of go together a lot like the the film noir detective always has to have the femme fatale girl that you know is trying to seduce him and probably also kill him at the same time and that's just the way that is yeah and in the case of this game it's uh it has some uh, pretty well not graphic but you know definitely has explicit scenes of toplessness and i don't know if it actually shows like you know all the everything but yeah this particular version is like uh you know pixelated uh not quite smut but pixelated naughty bits you get to see and if that's your thing that's your thing there's a lot of that on the pc 98 oh yeah that's yeah the adult adult visual novels the um, eroge games <laughs> that's another reason we didn't get that console here in the united states because we're pretty squeamish about that stuff plus you know it's like a uh yeah the P nec pc was like you know like its own architecture um and of course, Japanese exclusive. So, like, you know, Japan had like the uh, NECPC, the Sharp X 68K, the uh, FM Towns, and then, you know, here we had the, you know, Windows and um, Mac, IBM. You know, Europe had, you know, got, also got the MSX, the Amiga, the C64, even though we got the Commodore 60, the Commodore computers here, they weren't as popular as they were in, in no. Europe and uh, the UK. Yeah, there's the, so the kinda... ZX Spectrum is what I always think of as the quintessential Europe only system. Yeah, that's a big UK one. Like, I've been listening to a lot of uh, Retronauts, um, and uh, one of their hosts, uh, Stuart Jip, would come on with his friend. Um, uh, Dave Bomer and they a lot of times they'll talk about uh, ZX Spectrum stuff because that's what they grew up with because that was like a big big uh, part of like you know British kid life back in the uh, the 80s and early 90s yeah and like every game of that era has a demake for the ZX that's kind of like the Game Boy version of the game where you know there's only four colors and the sound is uh, definitely a downgrade from the original version but it kind of has its own charm nonetheless Speaking of charm, this next, uh, I think, I think we're getting on to your last set of tracks here already. Dang, this doesn't feel like it's been that long. Wow, this is crazy. We've almost, we've almost solved the mystery. Yeah, looks like you got me a twofer here. What is going on here? Yes, sir. First up, it's Ayumi, and then it's That's Right Two, both from Famicom Tante Club Two, a game that is for the Famicom Disk System. We didn't receive it over here until the remake for the Switch, which just came out, I think, in 2019. Yeah, both these are from Kenji Yamamoto.
some slight difficult difficulties we had to investigate the, where Tom went and we found him I thought the murderer got me but I escaped with my life this is true <laughs> and he is very much okay I'm looking at him he is safe and sound I see I see him right there so what we're, we uh, just, what you just heard there was Ayumi followed by that's right 2 from Famicom Tentai Club part 2 and uh, who was this composed by? Yeah, Kenji Yamamoto. That was composed by Kenji Yamamoto. Kenji Yamamoto, folks. So what do you know about the Famicom Tentai Club? Can you enlighten me, Professor? I know that they have really... I know that this is a series of visual novels that uh, began on the Famicom and that has been ported to the Super Famicom and the Switch and also the Game Boy Advance. And we did not see them here in the United States until the Switch ports. And they have really good soundtracks. And no, that was all I got. <laughs> I, I don't actually know that much about these games other than their soundtracks are fantastic. And they're detective games. Yeah, I know. I played a song from this on my, uh, what is it? Expansion Chip Extravaganza for the Famicom back at like I don't know one of when it was one of my first episodes and I featured a song from this one it was using the base um, you know NES sound chip or Famicom sound chip whereas these ones are actually using the uh, FDS system as you stated on the Famicom disk system which had a extra extra channel of sound that this system provided which was like a wavetable and it's usually kind of characterized by this kind of more rounder softer kind of sound as you can kind of hear like that arpeggiating sound in the background there these are such good soundtracks the re-release of this for the Super Famicom is one of the very last Super Famicom games. Oh dang! That okay. came out, which is also really cool. So that would have been in what, like 97, 98? 98. I mean, they're completely redone for the Super Famicom. All the graphics are new, the soundtracks are new, um, everything is different. And then they're completely redone again for the remake for the Switch. Was it? Were they part of like that, um, like the Satellaview thing? Like, were they? Um kind of like a limited time download thing or were they actually released on like cartridges proper do you know um i think they were released for the nintendo power service which is not a thing i'm familiar with okay that's where um that's the thing where you get like this cartridge that's a like a, a blank cartridge that has like maybe i think like four spaces on it for games and you take mm. it to this kiosk and you can load up games on there that are featured on there for like the week or the month like the Game Boy had the same thing. Oh, cool! So it's completely different than the Nintendo Power magazine we got. Instead, it was the yeah. No, they're totally unrelated. That is that is a cool concept. I can see why it didn't really work out over here, but over here we had video game rentals. I imagine I don't know if they had rentals there, but yeah, it was kind of a cool little service that they came up with. Like, uh, and the uh, Game Boy one, like you actually go to a kiosk that was like a giant Game Boy. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. That is such a cool thing. I've seen those pictures of that, of the giant Game Boy kiosk you go to, and that is the coolest design concept. I know, it's a pretty crazy idea to think about, and I totally see it not working here because uh, unlike, yeah, Japan, like, you know, they're not too much crazy, like, you know, kids aren't too crazy out there, but I'd imagine, I'd imagine if they had it here, you know, those things would be vandalized, like, within weeks. Yeah, it's like how they could call the game Puckman in Japan, but they couldn't. They had to call it Pac-Man here because people were going to turn that P into an F. And yep, chop off that little that little roundy bit at the end there. Yeah. <laughs> and now he's know. Pac-Man everywhere. So, you know, thanks, Vandals. Thank you, delinquents. Do you have any more factoids about this, Professor? 
No, actually, I don't. These are great soundtracks. I would like to play the full versions of the games, like the whole soundtrack on bo for both uh, Famicom Detective Club and Detective Club Two are great. And I had to, I really had to struggle to figure out which songs I was going to play, which is why we got two on this episode and not just one, because there are so many good tracks. It was, I, I couldn't just choose one. Well, Professor Tom, thank you for uh, coming into the shop and bringing me these uh, really cool investigation tunes and, like, you know, helping me find some of my own, like, investigating my own. You are welcome. Thank you for having me, and I'm glad I get a nice fat commission check for being here. It'll help me buy some nice stuff for the Shujin Academy VGM Club. Where exactly is this Shujin Academy located? So if you want to find Shujin Academy VGM Club, you can find that podcast on Spotify or Apple or anywhere else you find podcasts. I am also on Mastodon at Shujin Academy VGM Club at mastodon.coffee, and I hang out on Discord as Professor Tom7512. I'm also on Tumblr and Instagram as Shujin Academy VGM Club. And I do, in fact, have a YouTube channel that you can find by searching for Shujin Academy VGM Club. And a very fine after-school program it is. I would highly recommend you all check it out if you haven't already. And thank you again, Professor Tom, for bringing in your investigation tunes. Um, I probably figure that uh, the way how we were mo kind of prepared, we were more like uh, slightly bumbling detectives here. Not so much uh, Columbo, but maybe more uh, Hong Kong Fooey. But in any case, um, you know, definitely check out Shujin Academy VGM Club. It is a really fun time. And yes, uh, uh, it may have been stated that uh, Professor Tom did start his show around the same time as I did, and Martyrs of ReVGM and Jameson of Bar Silence. You know, I've already got Martyrs on here. I already, I just now had Professor Tom on here. Now I just got to get Jameson on here. Um, you know, eventually I'll reach out to him and see if he's down for it. You know, time will tell. And now I will tell you where you can find my show. Um, you know, if you've already li been listening for a while, you already know, but if you're new to the place, new to the VG Emporium, you can find it on all your favorite podcatchers, such as Spotify, Google, Apple, um, Stitcher, Spotify, I already said Spotify, Amazon Audible, Amazon Audible. And you can find it on all your favorite social medias if you have a favorite one, if anybody does, uh, such as Twitter, Instagram, and Mastodon. And then there's, if you're feeling a little extra adventurous, come on into the Discord. You can find the link in the show notes or on the uh, main page of vgemporium.wordpress.com. And then I've been your host slash proprietor of this fine establishment, Rage Cage. And uh, you can find me on all those social medias, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Mastodon, as well as uh, on SoundCloud where I post my original musics. Huh. So now, um, if you probably don't know, this is episode 68. Um, and you know what comes after 68? Come here, come here, got a little secret. 69, dude. So you can probably imagine what um, what it's going to be about. Um, actually, there's been a section that has uh, been under construction, under wraps a bit, um, and you're actually going to be meeting another one of my employees slash curators who is uh, running that section. Um, not quite sure how I feel about handing you over to him. He's a little on the strange. They all are, but this one is especially. You know, me personally, I can maybe present kind of like more of the lighter stuff of that genre of VGM and such, but um, not comfortable enough to like really get in deep with it. But um, my guy, the guy that you're going to be meeting next week, he, um, well, he doesn't have, uh, basically doesn't have a sense of decorum. But, you know, I, 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 I don't think things will get too out of hand. So, we'll, you know, we'll see how it goes. talk about a real detective now uh we're gonna play it's de we're gonna play detect <laughs>